The topic of chapter six addresses structural causes for women's inequality in representation. An important note here is that when discussing structural causes, the focus is on the construction of society instead of individual level attributes or behaviors that could be considered causes of outcomes for women. Structural causes sometimes overlap with the cultural causes we discussed in the previous chapter. For example, societal structure involves the family, the education system, and the labor force, all places where culture is interwoven into what we expect out of life in these scenarios. Structural causes are among the most controversial for individualistic societies like the United States because they point to the very precepts on which society is built as creating systematic disadvantages for women and for minority groups. It is very hard to reason that individuals are the causes of the mass underrepresentation and inequalities that we see from the macro level, but it is also difficult to change that in a society that holds tight to those traditions and doesn't like to see them challenged. So again, according to structural perspectives, the family, the education system, the labor force, as well as other societal structures, are configured in ways that prevent women from gaining skills necessary to participate in politics or compete against uh, men for public office. Instead of focusing on why men or women may not want to run for political office, structural arguments often center on why women cannot run for political office. In gender and politics research, there are several theoretical traditions related to structural arguments. One of those is modernization, or the ways that societies change as they industrialize and how that impacts women. Um, another one is the resource model of political participation. This model argues that differences in men's and women's political perspectives are the result of individual level inequalities and in certain prerequisites to participation, like money, free time, and civic skills. A third group of theorists, the elite theorists, um, link these factors explicitly to political decision-making positions, noting that political elites are often well-connected and highly educated and hold professional jobs in certain fields, such as law. The elite perspective also compares and contrasts the paths to office by men and women politicians. Gender stratification theorists, the fourth group, looks beyond individual differences between men and women to consider how societies are set up in ways that undermine women's power. And some stratification perspectives see women's economic power as a prerequisite to their political power. So one way to evaluate the theory of modernization is to look at different levels of economic development and women's representation. Um, so a country's level of economic development can be plotted as it is in this, in this table or figure. And this is using the World Bank's income categories that are based on gross national income per capita. And this shows that women's representation in parliaments uh, from 1970 to 2020 and uh, also women's share of cabinet positions beginning in 2005 do seem to correspond with the level of economic development. So higher average levels of political representation occurs in countries with higher incomes. So women are also disadvantaged when it comes to wealth, overall material well-being. Women are less likely to have an income of their own, which increases the risk of poverty and leads to the feminization of poverty worldwide. Globally, women are paid 63% of what men earn, and economists say it would take 20 years to close this gap. Women have less money after they pay necessities due to being paid less, so this means less money to finance campaigns and donate to other women's campaigns. In federal elections, women prov men provide more than two-thirds of all donations, so most of the money influence in politics is also quite gendered. And in terms of other types of wealth, men have more money in savings, stocks, pensions, and own more real estate, businesses, and other valuables than do women. And in the United States, women own 36% as much wealth as men. And this is in addition to the wage gap that we discussed with, where women earn 70% of men's earnings. And the wealth gap 
is worse for single Latinas and black women who own less than a penny for every dollar of wealth owned by single white men. Women candidates also earn or raise less money for their campaigns than men. In 2018, women running for Congress averaged 500,000 less in campaign donations than men. So some attempts to alleviate this problem have been to create fundraising organizations just for women, like Emily's List, and there are other PACs, uh, political action committees. And in some countries, the government provides funding for women. Other suggestions have included capping funding for campaign spending in order to limit the uh, influence of money and the disproportionate influence of some money. Another structural influence on women participating in politics, including running for office, is simply time. Women overall have less free time than men. Um, this is partially because they still do the overwhelming share of household care and work. Again, we're talking about globally. Um, this has resulted in what a lot of analysts have talked about uh, as a second shift for women. And this pattern holds for lawyers, businesswomen, educators, and people in politics. And basically what this is, is that even women who work full-time jobs have to come home and take care of the majority of uh, household responsibilities by themselves. So 43% of women reported that they are responsible for the majority of household tasks, whereas only 7% of men said the same. So the disadvantages are even more pronounced in the global south. In developed countries, women work an average of 30 minutes a day longer than men. And in the global south and developing countries, that figure is more like 50 minutes more than men. Some of this has to do with um, care activities in rural areas being more time consuming. For example, collecting water and collecting food can involve walking for miles. There's also a disproportionate amount of time spent caring for others. Um, women report spending twice the amount of time with children than fathers do. Some of the solutions to this include expanding the role of the welfare state in ways that help women, for example, through paternity and maternity leave, as well as funding for child care. Running for office and even just regular citizen participation in politics requires some development of civic and political skills, which structurally are not as accessible to women as they are to men. And so civic skills that we're talking about include communication and organizational abilities that allow citizens to use time and money effectively in political life. So some of the skills that we're referring to are speaking abilities, the ability to run meetings, understand parliamentary procedure, read and understand budgets, etc. And globally, worldwide, the trend is that women have fewer civic skills. This is partially because they are less educated, partially because they are less likely to hold the highly skilled jobs that help build these skills. One way that women have attempted to make up for this disadvantage through their careers is participation in voluntary association memberships, especially those through schools and related to their children. And some women have been able to use these kinds of associations to launch political careers. And there are also women's organizations and community activism that um, play an important role in socializing women and helping them build these skills that might also translate into political careers. However, not all types of voluntary um, association activism um, leads to political careers. And that's one of the important contexts that your books provides for this. So elite theorists tell us that political elites, the ones that are most likely to succeed in political careers, are highly educated people. They attend prestigious institutions and this provides them with access to elite networks. So education is a, an important element of political careers. It also is important for building the skills that we talked about in the previous slide. And in the developing world, education 
is important because it imparts some of the very basic skills necessary for careers like literacy, language, and communication um, that are essential for political participation as well as careers. Um, how women are navigating these disparities in education is a complicated question. So in primary and secondary education around the world, women are less educated and more likely to be illiterate. And on the other hand, in higher education, women are now outpacing men in more than 100 countries in terms of attending universities, earning graduate degrees. So one of the important questions that we ask, especially of this higher education question, is whether or not women are getting preparation and being channeled into the proper careers for politics. Um, so in these pipelines that channel women into important careers, you do see a lack of women or lower participation of women, for example, in business and in law. So the labor force participation of women is another area that helps them prepare for political participation. So a lot of skills, interest and knowledge, um, as well as access to important networks like labor unions and professional associations that could help women enter into political careers uh, come about because of women's participation in their jobs. Um, Working in careers uh, like lo law and business can increase women's sense of credibility. So this makes them better candidates. It also increases political participation once women are involved in the labor force and increases their demands for representation. So they're more likely to come into contact with sexism and discrimination and to recognize some of the problems that all workers experience and that might motivate them to get involved in politics. Another reason why work is important is that it provides an independent source of income for women. And this, according to a lot of research, has increased women's gender egalitarian views. Also, as more women enter into the workforce, their visibility in these careers and higher positions increases the legitimacy of women in people's minds. Um, it is important, though, that there is a critique from kind of the Marxist side of things, which points out that women are still heavily concentrated in the labor force instead of the ones who actually own the means of production and are able to allocate what surplus there is. So increasing labor force, force participation does not automatically give women control over the important resources necessary for ascending corporate and political ladders. Another part of structure is networks. The contact that you get with powerful people and powerful organizations, essentially. And sometimes networks are informal and have the ability to reinforce the political power of historically advantaged groups. And one of the things that's very interesting that the book points out is that capital for men in terms of social capital is largely homosocial, meaning that men network with other men and they are able to sort of rely on each other for loans, for recommendations when promotions are coming up and things like that. But women, because of these other structural disadvantages like money and um, disadvantages in, in entering into certain careers, this means that women have to rely on heterosocial networks and they are less solid um, and provide fewer resources for women. Another problem is that these networks are private, exclusive, and often invisible. So it is difficult to measure how influential they are. So think, for example, about the difference between the boardroom meeting and the meeting that takes place on golf courses. Um, and so if women are not involved in those homosocial activities, then they don't get access to conversations and negotiations that take place in informal networks. 
Um, so you often hear this referred to as boys clubs and old boys networks. And these are largely seen as limiting women's political recruitment, influence, and access to leadership. So violence against women and especially women in politics is another especially influential cause of women's lower representation and political life in general. An estimated 35% of women experience violence at some point in their lives. And remember, in some countries, it is much, much higher. There is also the problem of pervasive sexual violence against women, which leads to women's freedoms being restricted in many parts of the world. The threat of being sexually assaulted just for leaving your home um, often keeps women from engaging in political life. Another source of violence is electoral violence that's used specifically to intimidate women. You also have the problem of sexual harassment for women who make it into political careers. And political violence against women is... Um, somewhat gendered. Women are more likely to be targeted and are targeted differently. So they might be targeted with sexual and psychological violence, whereas men candidates face property damage and physical violence. So in this video, I have tried to cover some of the high points from the chapter um, and I do encourage you to read a little bit more in depth because some of the examples and data that they provide sheds a lot more light on these questions and problems.